Hey everyone, and welcome into this special off-season episode of The Homestand, the official podcast of the Kansas City Royals. It is a fun day because we are joined now by Royals brand new manager, Matt Cotrero. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. We are excited to have you here in the studio, but also here in Kansas City. I'm sure it has been a whirlwind couple of weeks for you. So we are excited that you are taking some time out to chat with us today. Well, I appreciate it. And I'm excited to be here and it's been a whirlwind, but a good one. Good. So we are going to start things off a little bit lighter and, and give you some quick fire questions to get a taste of who you are as a person. So, are you a dog guy or a cat guy? Dog guy. All right. Favorite TV show? Of all time. Of all time. Cheers. All right. Good one. What about music? Your Spotify playlist, who are you listening to? Uh, the Grateful Dead, Allman Brothers. Um, they would be my top two. Okay. I mean, I could go on. I, I was much more of a music guy when I was younger and had a lot more time to go to the record store. But What is the best thing that you can make in the kitchen? Uh, some sort of baked chicken, uh, not too, not too adventurous there. All right. No, there's nothing wrong with that. We don't need to be adventurous. What about baseball movie? Any favorite baseball movie or as a coach, is that something that you're not interested in watching? No, I love baseball. Okay. Movies. What do you yeah, got? I mean, I love, I, I, I like Bull Durham a lot. Okay. Um, Field of Dream, like all the typical ones, but Bull Durham, having gotten to play in Durham and go to all those places and experience it that that's one i really like okay i love that all right let's talk some about you and growing up you grew up in upstate new york what was it like growing up there and tell us some about that i had a great childhood great upbringing uh great home life uh, i was really fortunate to be exposed to all kinds of sports when i was young and my parents were both educators uh, my dad was an assistant principal my mom was a, a special ed teacher so they always had the summers and we had family vacations and that kind of stuff. So it was, it was a, it was a very normal, easy childhood. Did you do any other sports? I know you went to college, played baseball, you had your own baseball career, but did you do any other sports? Yeah, I played basketball, um, starting in middle school I, through high school. I played golf for a few years. Um, never played football. Parents wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> uh, They're looking really smart right yeah, about now. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, baseball, <clears throat> baseball and basketball were the two main sports and golf for a couple of years there until I realized I wasn't very good at it. Okay, golf is, is hard, okay? Yeah. It looks really easy, but it's hard, so I don't blame you. Now, you went to college at Old Dominion. Um, what was that like? We, you know, Vinny Pasquantino also is an Old Dominion guy. Very, you know, he's very loud about how much he loves it and how great his time was there. What do you have to say about your time there? Yeah, I had a great experience. I mean, it was, it was something I had no idea what I was getting into, you know, being from rural, more rural upstate New York, going to, for that, for that time, a big city for me to be in Norfolk. Um, it was great though. I, I, it was a, at the time, I'm not sure if it still is, but Old Dominion was a very big commuter school sure. um, from Virginia Beach and Norfolk. So really it was a tight knit group of baseball players and athletes that really just hung together. And I was very, very fortunate to have still some of my best friends in life that I was teammates with my freshman year and we've all kept in touch. So it was, uh, I was in a, put in a really good situation with real good coaches and players. So I had, a, I had an awesome experience there. Vinny told us that he was sold on the fact that he was told it was a school on the beach and he got there. <laughs> look at He's laughing. He's like, that's, that's not true. Uh, no, it's not even close <laughs> to the beach. I mean, I guess technically it's close to Virginia beach as the city of Virginia beach, <laughs> but the beach itself is a long ways away from, from the campus. He said he realized that once he got there, uh, but he was already bought in and was happy to be there. So it was funny to hear that story. I don't think I ever went to the beach in four years. There. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it, no, I was just not, we were never there in the summer either. So it wasn't, yeah, that's not close to the beach. <laughs> he was fooled. Um, tell us some about your career playing professional baseball. You were drafted out of out of college and you played for a number of years. Tell us some about that. Well, it wasn't a very good playing career. I mean, I, I was drafted as a senior, so I went into rookie ball as an older player, um, had some success in the lower levels and then had some injuries and player. Other guys were better than me and passed me by. And by the time I got to AAA, I was probably the the last guy on the on the roster and was able to kind of see the writing on the wall like I mean I was still fighting the fight you know wanted to get to the big leagues and tried every did everything I could to to try to get there but um didn't happen and you know 
was pretty apparent to me that I was going to need to transition to something else quickly after I got done playing. I just want to take your self-deprecation there for a second. It is so hard to be a professional baseball player in, ge in general. So the fact that you made it to AAA, like you always say you weren't very good at it. Like I heard you say that in the other press scrum. It's just not the case. So we, we're going to need you to stop saying well, you weren't very good. <laughs> relative to the guys I was playing against, they were. I was older yeah, and not as good as they were at a younger age. So it was not, uh, it's self-deprecation, but it's true. Too. I mean, there's got to be some, you know, reality setting and you know i was 27 or 28 years old playing in double a with guys that were 18 and mm -hmm. 19 i mean you have to look around and be like okay they're, they're this i'm not on the same <laughs> i'm playing on the same field but i'm not on the same playing field as these guys same metaphoric playing field yeah so when did you start thinking you know that maybe coaching could be something that you'd want to transition to i honestly i probably thought about it a lot in college because um, I would, like I said, I was very fortunate growing up, even from little league, I, I had great coaches, um, and all different types of coaches. Some were more technical, some were more, you know, just let them, let you play and give observations, but I had great coaches growing up. So I think I was influenced by that as well as my parents being educators. Um, but when I got to college, I had no concept of what the draft was or professional baseball. And one of my teammates as a freshman was a first round pick. And I was naive to the fact I, I would ask him like, Hey, do you think you're going to get drafted? And he was like, looking at me like, man, you know, you have no idea what you're talking <laughs> about. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't. So like, I honestly thought as I was finishing up school, like I would probably go right into coaching high school or college or something. Cause I didn't know if I would get drafted. Um, but then when I did, then my focus turned to, well, I, I want to do this, mm -hmm. you know? So, but once I got, injured a couple times. I had a lot of time to just sit and not play and watch other guys play and talk to the staff. And I, it, I kind of had a feeling that I wanted to go that direction. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, taking that time and playing in pro ball like you did has helped you in pro coaching? Because there's, there's a difference, you know, college is great. We see it with football too, but the jump from college, you know, to the pros is, is a big one and how these guys go about it. In college, they're really still just kids, but here they're men. And so how you coach is probably different. So do you think it was valuable for you to have that time playing in the pros for a while to help you coach now? Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, when I was on in AAA, not playing very often, I always kind of thought to myself, Oh, I don't know if I could go back and start coaching and rookie ball and you know because you, you get to a certain level and you're like this is kind of where I feel at home where I belong with these players but the best thing that ever happened to me was going to start coaching at the lowest levels because it rejuvenated me like I didn't feel like uh, I, I wasn't missing the game at night that the triple-a level or the double-a level that I thought I should be playing in it was just about focusing on those players and helping them get better. And it just charged my batteries that I, I've kind of never lost that. Yeah. That's so cool to have that, you know, that feeling where, where you're just ready to get into it, but also knowing that every, you know, moment that you had before that has helped prepared you for that. So I'm, I'm guessing when you get into it and, and you make the jump finally to being a coach, was it a smooth transition for you or was there a little bit of a learning curve? It sounds like you kind of eased your way into it, but still, I mean, it, it could probably be a shock to the system a little yeah. bit. Well, it was definitely a learning curve. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, you've never been a coach before. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've thought about it and you know, there's concepts that you've talked to coaches about or, but yeah, when you're actually the one that has to teach something and you have to be able to explain it clearly and concisely to people and get that message across and try to motivate it's totally different. So yeah, there's, I don't think that learning curve ever goes away. You know, it changes year to year. You have to prove yourself to yourself and to the people you're working with every year. Tell us about that first stint in the Rays organization uh, in the, on the coaching side of things. Tell us what that was like. Cause that was at the lower levels, you know, coaching through your way up. So just like the players, you're starting at the bottom and yeah. like working your way up. Tell us some about that. Yeah, it was unique because I, I actually started coaching as a, um, it was before the 2004 season and I was still going to go play in Italy. Um, so they brought me to spring training as like just to, to help out. And I was still working out because I thought I was going to play. And then when the thing fell through to play, they asked me to stay. And I actually signed as a, a player contract because there was no spot, but the farm director was, a, you know, he and I had a good relationship and he said, well, we'll sign you to the player contract 
that'll get you insurance for your family and that kind of stuff. And then maybe two or three weeks later, one of the coaches that was going to go to the New York Penn League resigned. So that spot just opened and I kind of just fell into it. And so it was a, a good experience for me to start at that level. I worked with veteran coaches those first couple of years that were great to me. They, they helped me figure out what I was doing and they, they helped me learn how to prepare. And, you know, one of the guys I still, I mean, I still talk to these guys today, but, um, Steve Henderson was a long time major league player coach at all kinds of levels. And he said to me, Hey, pay attention. You're going to learn as much what you don't like about what other coaches do as you are, what you do like. And just, so you got to pay attention to both sides of it. And that thing has always kind of resonated with me. Yeah. You learn so much by, by listening and, and watching other people go about their work, you know, in that same vein, you've worked with some really incredible coaches, Kevin Cash, uh, Terry Francona, I mean, you've obviously learned a lot from them. Was there a lot of watching for that, or did they take you under their wing, wing as well? Oh, there's a lot of watching. Yeah. I mean, I, going to Cleveland, that was my first time ever in the big leagues as a player, coach, anything other than just major league spring training. And uh, that was a veteran coaching staff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Tito, he, he had all of his managerial duties and stuff. So as much of my watching and listening was to with the other coaches, with mm -hmm. Ty Van Berkeley, Brad Mills, Mike Sarbaugh, Sandy Alomar, those guys were incredibly welcoming to me um, and were just open books, like ask questions of them, you know, but just pay attention, listen, watch, you know, and I was very fortunate to get into an organization where there were great people and there was talent too. So it was, I, it was like the best of both worlds for my first experience, but a lot of listening, a lot of watching and Ka Cashy was on that staff as well. But you know, there's a, he was with the pitchers a lot. So I wasn't around him a ton that season, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I ask a lot of questions still to this day of him and like, and, and everybody. So I think there is a lot of listening. How do you like take what you're learning, but also like make sure that you're being true to like who you are as a person? Yeah, I mean, I think that's how you live your life, right? Or you hope to. I mean, you have to be true to yourself and you're not going to please everybody with everything you do or ha who you are. But if you start trying to please everybody, you're going to please less of those people, you know, and you're not going to be happy yourself. So you, I think you nailed that. I mean, there is a 0% chance I could ever be Tito. You know, he, he's just got his own personality. I could never be Cashy. I couldn't be Dusty Baker. I mean, they're all relying on their lived experiences as players, as people, you know, how they grew up. And I think that's one of the things that they're good at is realizing where their players have come from and what their lived experiences are and getting the best out of them. Yeah. You know, we mentioned all this stuff you're going through, but I have to bring up your support system. All right, at let's home. take a quick your wonderful break wife. Here. You also have two boys, but you know, this is a transition for them being here. But then I'm also wondering how it was, you know, transitioning from being a player to a coach and all the steps along the way. Your wife is along for that, and yeah. you're having kids in the mix of all that. So it's you're going through a lot. What is the support system like to be able to do what you're doing? The baseball life is not for everybody, and it's not easy on families for sure. Um, you know, we, my wife and I have been together since high school, so she's seen the whole journey, you know, the ups and downs, the pros and cons, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we, we try to be as rational as we can when we make decisions on whether we should take an opportunity or not, even if it was within the same organization, you know, just make our pros and cons list and see what we think. And she's been overwhelmingly supportive of everything. And you know, these last couple moves have been real big for her moving to Florida and now coming out here. So, but she's, she's all in. Yeah. you got to be, you cannot be half in, in this industry for sure. What about the boys? How are they settling in? I met them when you were first introduced. Oh my gosh, they are a hoot, but tell us some about the boys. Uh, yeah, the, you know, they're, they're seven and five, so they're not, I don't, you know, I don't think they have a great grasp on exactly what's happening. Um, but, you know, we, we talk about it as much as we can, you know, without overwhelming them with it, <clears throat> because I think there'll be some transition, you know, getting yeah. new schools and new friends and the whole the whole dynamic. But I think they're going to like it. I think, you know, we've heard so many good things about raising families out here and this, the community rallying around you and all those things. So uh, 
we're looking forward to that. What a gift that they have. You know, they can't appreciate it now because they're so young, but to be able to grow up in a major league locker room, pretty much, I think of that with the Granky boys too, when they would run around and I would see them like, what a gift that they have. Not many people can get that. And you want to keep them humble and down to earth. But I think when they get older, they're going to realize how cool it was yeah. and, th and that gift that you were able to give them. Yeah, I think so too. And I, you know, whether it's a major league locker room or a minor league locker room, I mean, I think there's a lot for them to learn. Mm -hmm life lessons too. I mean, that's one of the best things about sports is learning how that those lessons translate to life. Um, so yeah, I think they'll appreciate it at some point. I, I always like telling this little story when we were fortunate enough to be at the all-star game last year and they, we were allowed to bring them down for the home run derby and they had no interest in watching <laughs> the home run derby, but they were on the, the little sofas that are set up outside the dugout and they were not staged at all. They were perfectly positioned on the couch and then this guy pops up right between them and it was Ken Griffey Jr. And I said, all right, I got to take a pic. I said to him, hey, if you don't mind, just stay there for a second. I got to take a picture. They have no concept of this right now, but one of those things that maybe 10, 15 years from now, they're going to be like, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that yeah. story. Yeah. You know, bringing your family here was something that was really important to you. A manager, when they're hired, doesn't, it, it's not required of them. Typically, a team doesn't require them to move to that city, but you guys were really adamant that you wanted to move here and be a part of the community. Why was moving here so important for you? Well, I mean, being here and understanding what the Royals mean to the community and, I, you know, being here as a visiting coach for several years and when the Royals were winning and it, it was dynamic here and to see that support and want to be part of that, it's kind of electrifying, you know, it's something that you want your family to be exposed to. The other side of it is <clears throat> with the age of my kids, I can't conceptualize not having them here, you know, and we did the distance thing for plenty of years, whether it was just my wife and I, or when we had kids and it just to the point where I, I don't want to miss, you know, we're going to miss, I'm going to miss enough as it is. Right. But get as much time as possible. So the very human question I have to ask you is moving sucks for anyone. <laughs> How's the moving going? <laughs> you know what? Uh, last week when JJ and the guys were at the uh, GM meetings, my wife and I just put a full court press on the house and we got a pod. We got a, uh, somebody to come haul away some stuff. And we basically packed up, I'd say probably 75% of the house last week so that they could take pictures and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to do it together. She's done the other moves all on her own. So I'm trying to be there as much as I can to help with this one. Um, and so far it hasn't sucked that bad. I mean, it's probably, <laughs> You know, things are going as smooth as they can right now. Good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, you know, is your wife or your kids, uh, you know, Kansas City has a lot to offer, but we don't have palm trees or a beach. So how did they react to losing that part of Florida? That's a great, that's a great thing to have. Yeah. You know, we have barbecue. We have a lot of other stuff. We've got great beer. We've got a lot of culture here, but we, we don't have those, those two things. We're never going to have those. So how well, are they doing with the adjustment? We didn't have palm trees or a beach in upstate New York either. So there you go. we're probably getting into an environment that's more like what we're used to than those palm trees and the beach. So we can go on vacation to the beach at some point. There so, you go. And we don't have hurricanes here. So that's a big thing for us. So true. Yeah. We do not have those. That that's definitely that's definitely a good positive, especially this time of year. You just never know what's going to happen. Are there certain pockets of Kansas City you've been able to explore while you've been house hunting? And of course, you've been here as a visiting coach before, so the plaza area I'm sure you've seen. But are there any other little pockets of Kansas City you've been able to get to see? Um, not so much this time. I mean, driving to look at houses. My wife did all, I mean, she looked at 20 houses in two days and then I- Oh my gosh, bless her. Yeah, I didn't realize how much that was until I went to look at three yesterday. <laughs> and so she did 20 in two days. So um, I know generally how to get to Overland Park and to Lee's Summit just to like get there. But sure. I, no, I don't, I wouldn't say I've explored much. Staying at the plaza all those years, you know, I've seen that and I've really liked the, the park that's up above that, uh, I think it's Loose Park or something yep. like that to walk around up mm -hmm. there. That's a that's a great area. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I don't have a working knowledge of the neighborhoods. Or You'll anything. get there. I will. You will get there. I will. Uh, I've also heard a rumor that you're a big college basketball fan. Who's your team? Well, I got, I'm going to be 100% honest. I've always been a KU fan and a Georgetown fan. Okay. So those are my two big teams. You're not you're not just saying that to like. No, butter I, told, us up, I are told you? some of the guys in the in the press conference or after the press conference that 
I was hooked from the 88 national championship game. It was the best game I've ever seen to this day. And now, I got to be honest, too, I don't watch nearly as much as I used to since having kids and all that kind of stuff. So, But, you know, growing up, college basketball was my favorite. Wow. That's, uh, that's awesome. Are you going to get there to a game, try and get over there? I would love to. I mean, yeah, we're, I don't know when, you know, with all the stuff going on and moving and stuff. But, yeah, I would love to get out there. I was fortunate a um, handful of years ago, Swanee helped me get a tour out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was awesome. I, I was in awe of the whole, the whole, the history of it. I, being a history buff, like that kind of thing really, really intrigued me. I want to transition back to baseball some and and ask you, you know, how obviously it's been a world where there's a lot going on. It, it's like you get this dream job and then it's like full speed ahead. And people think that the off season is long. You know, the fans are like, oh, when's baseball? And here I've seen you walking in and out. You're coming in every day is early in the morning. Uh, there is so much to do and there's certain dates we have to hit. So how how have you been adjusting getting this this dream job you know being here but then full speed ahead yeah no you're right i mean there is a lot to do but it's not it's not overwhelming because i think we have a good system in place mm-hmm. here you know jj and scott and everybody has been in place so they know how to handle the stuff that those dates you have to hit right but we're interviewing coaches we're making phone calls all those kinds of things which is even even in a normal off season, you're doing a lot of that stuff. Your phone calls might just be directed in a different direction or whatever. But um, yeah, it's exciting too. That's the thing is it, it's new. It's obviously all new for me still. Um, and you know, it's not always it, the greatest thing to interview. And you know, you don't you don't want to have to do that every year because you want some stability. But you get to talk to interesting people that are passionate about baseball, and so that part of it's fun. I want to talk to you some about Paul Hoover. And he is, you brought him over here on the staff as well, which is great. We are happy to have him. But you guys have known each other. You played together in minor leagues, didn't you? Yeah, we were roommates for two or three years. And we've known each other for, I'm, I'm not even sure, probably 25 years or so. Yeah, and, and you know, he, he had a better career than I did and played for a long time. So we, we weren't super close those years when he was off playing and I was already coaching. But we always stayed in touch. And then since 2012 he's been coaching in the Rays organization and we've been on the big league staff together for the last four years so we we have a long history together how important are those relationships that you make through baseball i tell people all the time the baseball world's pretty small and the relationships you make are so important whether those are relationships with other families or coaches or or whatever it is but that's obviously a relationship that's been nurtured for a long time, and here it is becoming fruitful as you come here into this managerial position. Yeah, I'm excited to be able to have him come and we can do this together, you know, and, and that's something that really I have to thank the Rays for because that's not the norm that they allow people to take other people with them. So that, that was really cool of them to allow that and to give us that support and give Paul that opportunity to, to come with me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to share in this with him and to also – know that he's going to bring a ton of value and the peop- the team here is going to really love him. Yeah, we're excited as well to have Paul Hoover as our bench coach for next year. It, it's exciting to see all these pieces come into place and it's kind of like you're doing this this little jigsaw puzzle. But when have you had a chance or have you had a chance to reach out to any of our guys? We have such a dynamic group of guys on our roster, obviously very rookie heavy from last year. But then we also have guys like Salvador Perez and he his you know he speaks for himself his career so you've got a wide variety of players here what has it been like you know sinking you know your teeth into into everything going on there it's been great i mean i've been uh really surprised um at how positive all the conversations have been you know salvi was the first guy i called and went through the whole roster little by little it was interesting you know we had guys on honeymoons and guys that were at those weddings and so it was uh, and then you have guys on the West Coast and guys on the East Coast and in different countries. So trying to trying to nail them all down, you know, I've, I think I've gotten to talk to almost everybody. Some still just in text that we're trying to line up phone calls, but the whole staff and everything like that, trainers and strength coaches, it's been awesome. I've, I've, I'm not a huge like just pick up the phone and make phone calls for, for no reason kind of thing, small talk. But these conversations have been really enjoyable and it's gotten me even more energized about about what we're about to take off on. Yeah, what is what are you most excited about? Like, I mean, obviously putting the pieces together is exciting, but but molding these players as well and, and seeing what we can build here. And, and I, the future is so bright, but there's so much work, you know, to put those pieces in place. So what excites you the most? 
Yeah, I mean, really, it's just getting to know the guys and yeah. getting to see them play. You know, and you know, you're managing the team, but you don't control everything that these guys do, right? These guys are right now working as hard as they can to get ready for the season, and that's exciting to see when everybody comes together to see the work that's been put in. And I know they're energized to to perform better. And the the sentiment that I've heard from all these guys is like, we're tired of not winning. Like we've won in the minor leagues. We know we can win. We know what that's like. Now it's just a matter of transitioning it to the big leagues, which is a big change. You know, it's, I'm, we're not taking that lightly and it's not, um, it's not something that we expect is just going to be flipped the switch. But at the same time, you know, you watch a lot of major league games, the difference between winning and losing every night is razor thin. And it's just getting some of those games to flip our way um, by doing things a little bit better than they've been done in the past. And I think there's some natural growth that's going to come there, but there's also some things that as a team collectively, I'm excited to see these guys do it together. How are you feeling getting used to playing home games outside? Because you were playing <laughs> inside before and Kaufman is a is a specific field. We have such a big outfield. Yep. So you definitely have to be aware of that, you know, from pitching, from hitting, things like that. So that, that adjustment. Let's pause for a word from our yeah, sponsors. No, I mean, I, I was outside for four years in Cleveland, too, and um, and played here a lot in those years as a visiting coach. Um, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I'd, I'd much rather be outside playing baseball. I mean, that's how it was how it was invented and how I, you know, you, everybody grows up playing outside. And um, the all, the real benefits about the, the dome or any dome is you know you're going to play every mm -hmm. night. You don't have to deal with rain delays and all that kind of stuff. So that's the one positive. You can always get your work in and those things. But... You know, the, the turf takes a toll on guys, um, and that's something that here, there's different things. You know, there's heat and wind and all that cold weather, but um, I'm excited. I, I like the outdoor, and this stadium has just such a great environment. I want to hear some about what your experience was like being in the World Series, the COVID World Series with, with the Rays, and, and what has that experience been like for you? That was such a weird season in general, but to get there and to build what they had built, it was incredible. Uh, did that excite you? And did that, what, like, what are you taking from that experience that's going to help you here in this position? Well, that, that whole year, like you said, you know, we didn't, we just sitting at home, Zoom call after Zoom call and all that stuff. But then like, hey, we're starting. Mm -hmm. And we had to figure out how to plan and how to get that ready with one field and, you know, not a normal spring training and all that kind of stuff. So that, that was odd. Once the season started, it definitely had a weird vibe. No fans, you know, the fake cutouts and the pumped in crowd noise and all that kind of stuff. So all of that was very odd. But the thing that really stood out is like the biggest difference. You know, we were we were in San Diego for the playoffs. And so we played New York and Houston with no fans. But the intensity in those games in the dugout was insanely high. And I, I really gave the players credit all year for being able to compete at that level with something that they're not used to at all no no adrenaline coming from the ballpark that was amazing but then to transition from no fans to i believe it was 50 percent capacity in dallas um but that felt like we were in front of hundred thousand fans <laughs> because we had been in front of no one and that's a huge ballpark um so to me that was the biggest shock to see people in there again and you know like just the uncertainty. We're still testing every day for COVID and all those kinds of things. There are a lot of abnormalities, but the excitement of that was was still nonetheless being in the World Series. And, you know, if you didn't have that excitement and you looked across the field, you saw the Dodgers and you knew how good they were, like, you better get fired up for this, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's still the World Series, even though it's a weird year, but our guys were awesome about it. That's so cool that you said that the intensity in the dugout was still there because it, no doubt when the fans are into the game here, it, it's so thrilling and I know it helps the players, but you saying that just proves like you, you got to push your own meter and you got to realize where you are. If there's no fans there, like we got to get pumped up. So somehow, so that's so cool that you, like the intensity was there. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's no secret in Tampa, like fan attendance isn't our strong point there. Um, so well, they're the, all at the beach. Yeah, that's true. But the, play, <laughs> the players, they still, I mean, they have to perform at yeah. that level. You can make an excuse if you want, but that doesn't help at the end of the day. You're still out there trying to compete and compete at a high level. And I think that's something that the best players do is you could play, you know, like I said, we all grew up playing outside in front of no fans and you still played your heart out. And that's what I think 
what I, the vibe I'm getting from these guys is they'll play in a parking lot if they have to, to just to, to, to compete. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Sandlot style, right? Yeah. That's how yeah. we all started. Um, tell us some about what you think uh, will be like your arrival moment here at the K. Is it going to be opening day? Like when are you going to get your like, you know, goosebumps moment where you feel like you've arrived here and, and we're going full steam? Yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> Generally, opening day is a, you know, it's a big deal, right? And you stand out on the line and you kind of soak it all in. You think about how you, regardless of whether you're a player, coach, whatever your position is, you kind of soak it all in but something i've tried to do is is every day have a little bit of that soak it in you know so you don't take any one day for granted because these jobs aren't guaranteed to anybody regardless of the level you're at you know and i think that's an important uh perspective to keep and that's something i do every day i want to circle back around to your sport system and your family and and, and how you do stay grounded in all this because at the end of the day we're playing a game, which is great, but there, there's a lot going on. There's people's careers. There's a lot, a lot of money. There's a lot of powerful things going on. And baseball is so big to American culture and everything, but you kind of got to dull it all down to, to stay focused, stay centered and stay down to earth. And I'm assuming your family has a lot to do with that, but, but what do you do to, to stay down to earth? Yeah, that's not my biggest issue to, to stay grounded like that. I think it's my upbringing, you know, yeah. my parents, both educators, um, you know, and my dad would always, and my mom too, they always just said, you know, don't ride the roller coaster. You know, you know, if you're, you're getting stressed about a test, just prepare for the test, do the best you can. And then if you take the results for what they are, if you want to do better, you prepare better the next time. You know, it's not a, it's not a panic and think the worst is coming kind of situation. And that's kind of how I deal with pretty much everything I or try to anyway. Um, if you could say one thing to our fans for this coming year, what, what do you want to say to them? Everyone's really excited about you being here. There's, there's, you know, this aura in the air, there's a lot of excitement going on. What do you want to say to our fans? Well, I'm equally as excited, you know, so, I mean, I, I hope I can, I hope we, and I can match that excitement and, and hopefully that translate out onto the field. But yeah, your excitement is Probably not as much as mine, so we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that. A lot of excitement going on. Have you have you gotten any Kansas City barbecue? If you have, what's been your favorite, or what's your barbecue plan? You need a plan. Need There's a, a lot plan. of options. I need a plan because I don't. I haven't been anywhere yet. I've only been here to the ballpark and back and forth. So I need guidance. Um, I honestly couldn't. You know, we get barbecue when we'd come here as a visiting player at the clubhouse. So I don't know where it came from, okay. that kind of stuff. So I need a lot of guidance. I've disappointed everyone that's asked me that question because I don't have a, a pecking order or even, to be honest, know the names of the places. <laughs> so I need I need a guide. We will we will get you a plan. We will tell everyone to clear your schedule. Q needs some time to explore the barbecue, the real important things here in Kansas City. So we will make sure that we get that done. Now, is it okay if people call you Q? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because sometimes people get a little tricky with your last name, but yep. you're, you're good with Q? Yeah. All right, there you go. You guys have uh, you know, his approval here to call him Q. Thank you so much for being here and chatting with us. Is there anything else you want us to know or anything else you want us to get out to the fans? No, I mean, I, I, we look forward to the support of the fans. You know, I know the players appreciate that. Like you said, it drives the energy level up and just remembering what it's like here when the team's winning and that energy drives the players. Um, so I think it, and it's going to be an exciting group of guys, you know, and, and I think the more excitement we generate on the field, the more it'll be in the stadium. And I think we're looking forward to just growing that together. All right. Well, we can't wait. Thank you so much for being here, Q. You are a royal. We're happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us for this special off-season episode of The Homestand. We want to give a big shout out to Casey Custom Hardwoods for this beautiful desk right here. And we're so excited for what's to come. We'll see you very soon.